So today's phrase of the day, salutem um, usually is preceded by a noun in the nominative case. Hey, that's pretty spiffy. I like how that opens up. Um, it's also commonly going to include a noun in the dative case. Not all the time, but quite commonly it will include a noun in the dative case. And you guys can see the translation is already up there. I don't want to trouble you with the third declension noun salutem, at least until lesson 40 when we start the third declension nouns. I don't want you to worry too much about the third declension, sorry, the adjective plurilem. But a super literal translation of this is so and so in the nominative case says very much health to such and such in the dative case. A less literal translation, so and so sends very fond greetings to such and such. What is the formal name for a part of a letter, the opening of a letter, where you say something like, dear President Obama, or uh, dear Mr. Mancuso? No, it isn't. It isn't the addressing or the address line. It's the salutation. It's the salutation, right. Which, as a, an English derivative, takes its name from the noun salutem. And the salutation usually expresses a wish for somebody's good health, their prosperity, or an expression of how important those people are to you. And so, this is a very, very frequently used salutation in the nominative, sorry, in letters, in ancient letters. And when we finally get around to um, talking about the Lesson 39 story, which we'll probably do tomorrow after the test, um, I know you say, that's not fair, it's after the test. That's okay. Um, you, you'll see that uh, as, in fact, the very opening of the lesson, uh, sorry, of the letter that makes up the Lesson 39 story. Okay, questions? You guys terribly tired of this opening letter saying, congratulations, you've been invited to the May Awards Assembly. <clears throat> Got the National Latin Exam results. Okay, uh, I don't know. We'll talk about that later, later, much later. Okay. <clears throat> when the cows come home. What cows? <laughs> All right. <laughs> The, the, the cows that have the good sense to know not to come home yet, because we don't want to discuss the National Latin Exam results. I'm going to ask you guys to do a warm-up that is in some ways related to um, the grammar and um, vocab review opportunity that you guys have in Lesson 39. So, if I can walk over to the computer and swiftly grab the capacity to write. Tell me, guys, what does duxistus mean? Why, yeah, so uh, you led. You led is a fine translation, or? Yeah, that works. You did lead. Or a third option, not that I want to um, beat this into the ground. Hi, sorry. Yes, you have led. Now, I'm not saying that this is a task that's going to be on tomorrow's quiz exactly, but what I'd like to do is go back to knowledge that you want to make sure you have before you take tomorrow's quiz on verb stems from third principal parts. I'm sorry, from the principal parts of third and third IO conjugation verbs. Um, everybody, what stem is this built from? Everyone? The third principal part of duco, ducere, duxi, ductus. And what's a good opportunity for you guys to recall is gesundheit. That the third principal part, again, gesundheit, is used for the perfect active system. The perfect active, the true perfect active, and the future perfect active. Okay? Legimus. Let's move on. Um, why, Joey? Be, you did, read. 
I'm going to hold off on the, the you part of it. Or we did you. Good. Okay. With uh, most ending, it's well translated as we did read. Is there another translation possible, JB? Or we could just say we did gather. True, we could. Yes, I'm, I'm going to be lazy and stick to the meaning read, but you could also translate this as we did gather. So, um, like, we had read? Not quite had, because that would be used for the pluperfect tense. We, we have read? Yeah, we have read works nicely for the perfect tense. And then third option, um, some printing. Um, we read. Yeah, you could also translate it as we read. Okay. What is the danger of this two-word phrase in English? Oh, you guys are two, two on top of this. Uh, Joy? Yeah, um, I could choose to read it as a present tense form. We read Latin every day, or we read the newspaper yesterday. What I'm getting at is that every once in a while in English, there are word forms that have ambiguous spelling, easily confused spellings, um, as far as the difference between tenses goes. Isn't that also true for legemos as a Latin verb? What's the only difference between this verb as perfect tense or past tense and a different verb that would mean we read in the present? This comes from the third principal part. And guys, what is the distinguishing fe feature of this third principal part? The macron over the e. This becomes one of those crazy important macrons. As I tried to throw at you two days ago, every once in a while there's a verb that forms its perfect stem, as seen in its third principal part, merely by lengthening the vowel in the stem. You guys know another verb like that from the list that I've asked you to start reviewing on page 260, whatever it is? Yeah, kind of, but there's 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 one that's even stronger where the only difference is a macro. Yes? Is it Plico? No. Plico, Plicaria, different stem. Not quite Pono, because it's Pono, Ponera, Pasui, where an S is distinct from It's kind of sort of Fakio, but Fakio, Fakara, Feiki. The lengthening of the A in Fakio actually changes it so much that it becomes an E. So it moves from A to A. Cupio? No, Cupio, Cupere, Cupiwi. It rhymes with Cupio, though. No? No? <clears throat> I'm going to give you guys this on your test tomorrow. Big fat F. Followed by you. <laughs> Jake knows. Jake, what does Jake know? Fugio, Fugera, Fugi. Okay. Sorry, that was weird. Um, but the 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 macron over the U is the only way to tell the difference between the present stem and the perfect stem. And I, I do want you to be cautious about that. Okay. All right, good. Um, anyone know what Proponi is? A three-year-old going to race in the Kentucky Derby is a Proponi? <laughs> oh, sorry, that's inaccurate, isn't it? Like most of what I say. Trying to get it out of the way. Back to ink. Okay. Um, cool. Uh, is it I am put forth? Or I am um, sent in for put forward for the sedative and the meaning? You could use the meaning offer. I am offered. 
I am offered doesn't quite work. Okay. I am being offered doesn't quite work. Okay. This one is very, very tricky. Emma. Um, I am offering. I am offering doesn't quite work. Okay. Oh, and before your arm falls off. Would it be I offered? It isn't I offered. I'm going to write that. And now I'm going to ask you to tell me why it isn't I offered. I don't really care right now for you guys to tell me what proponi is. But what would I offer be? That would be a lot like we read, a lot like you led. It would be the perfect active. What's the third principal part of propono? Yeah, I offered would be pro posui. Okay, it would be preposterous to say that proponi is the same as pro posui. See what I did there? Arm. It isn't I was offered because um, I want you guys to stay away from I subjects. Okay. Jay? Um, this isn't Jeopardy. You don't have to ask in the form of a question. Have you been offered? No, because that would be the fourth principal part, proposity. Right, Peter? Is it to be offered? There we go. <laughs> what evil thing did I do? I gave you a passive infinitive to be offered. Okay. So th this is tough, and this is why we're doing it as a warm up and not as part of the test tomorrow. Okay. Um, but proponi is built from the first and second principal parts the propono, proponera. It's ending long I, though, isn't giving it an I subject. It's converting it into a passive infinitive. All right. It's to skeptics. Should you? Um, could you say, like, something? I know it was undertaken, so, like, I, um, I, I, you can say I was undertaken, right? You don't want to do that because the skeptic actually doesn't have a subject. It doesn't have an I subject or a U subject or any subject. So would it be like to be undertaken? That's that's an infinitive. Um, this is not an infinitive. It's a participle, a verbal adjective. So has been undertaken? Not quite. Sydney? Yes. There we go. It, the, the magic trio of words, if you want to. It's okay, no words. Magic trio of, you, of words. If you want to use a trio of words with a perfect passive participle, a PQ, would be having been, and then whatever the English past participle of the root verb is. In this case, undertake and okay. So we could say something like this. Um, there, there is a Latin word that is masculine and nominative and singular that means mission. Okay, so we could say the mission undertaken by James Bond caused his promotion to. You know, uh, what, what rank does James Bond have? Is he commander? Well, yeah, but yeah, he, he used to serve in the Navy, and I think he held the rank of commander. So, I don't know. Made him captain. All right. Long and short of it. Um, that's a bit of review that we're going to come back to for the test you guys are going to take tomorrow, which is not just on Lesson 39 vocab, but also includes familiarity with verb stems and how to translate them. Should we do that now, or should we do that later? Later. Here we go. All right, so in answer to, to Joey's crazy question about how to form the passive infinitive, 
and then to um, uh, let's discard the and then to go on to discuss the format of tomorrow's little quizification, um, we're going to do those things on a very different software here. Okay. All right. So passive infinitives. It's a first, second, or fourth conjugation verb. Plico. Okay. Plico, placata, first conjugation. It's, um, no, this isn't right, is it? My goodness. Yeah. Sorry. I wasn't ready for that question, and I didn't turn on my brain all the way to answer it. Um, it's the second principal part minus the E plus long I. So you'd move from placata which means twofold, and then it would become placari, okay. which would mean to be folded. Okay. So it would be like sitting Joey down in a room surrounded by reams and reams of uh, 11 by 17 paper, giving him the job, holding him into origami piece, um, and locking him in overnight, um, and having him uh, then make origami geese overnight. So I want these geese to be folded by sunrise. <coughs> and, unless you can guess my name. Although, <laughs> You're, you're not at all to be confused with the princess whom Rumpelstiltskin imprisoned. Okay. <clears throat> Joey is a princess? No, I can't see it. Um, if it's a third or third I.O. Conjugation verb. Okay. It's the second P.P one of these verbs, and then what do you drop away? Make sure you got rid of, get rid of the whole ERE -E ending from the second principal part. And you add, once again, that long I. So you can move from ponera to my little pony. Or Legera <laughs> to read would become leggy, which, by the way, is not the same thing as leggy. Legera to read, leggy to be read. Oh, my goodness. This is a passive infinitive. Leggy? I read, or I have read, or I did read. Okay, so that answers Joey's question. Um, it doesn't necessarily answer the question of how I'm going to be quizifying you on uh, the, the test tomorrow. And so, shall I go ahead and do that? Yes. Okay. All right, so. <coughs> Do this with a, an oral description, a written description, um, in words, and then we'll look at an example. First, standard format vocab or the short little list. Second, given a huge chart 
or list of principal parts. for third and third I.O. conjugation verbs. Can you match the principal parts with their appropriate meanings? done a test kind of like this before, where what I give you is a huge long list, it's not huge really, but a longish list of the principal parts of verbs you've been asked to review. Just the principal parts. And if that principal list of principal parts is given to you, you would be able, the goal is, to match that principal part with its most appropriate translation. So, should we see some examples? Yeah. Before I show you the examples, I have to get rid of this screen. Do you guys still want the screen? Is that it? Just for a little bit. That's, a, that's all on the quiz, yeah. Okay. okay. Right, so we're waiting, which is fine. And you guys can see um, this is the verb review sheet that I suggested that people print out from my website or get a copy from me. Is there anybody who still would like a photocopy? Thanks. Let's for a moment pretend this is all filled in and you know everything that's on here. And I pull off of this the second, sorry, second principal part of Duco. And it's not going to let me write on it. That's okay. I can write the old fashioned way. Second principal part of Duco? Duco right All right. Now, would you match that with? I have led, to led, to be, sorry, to lead, excuse me, <laughs> to be to led, led okay, or having been led. I, I know, but I'm going to choose someone I, I really don't like very much, Jay, so. Nick. Oh, sorry. Nick's not here. Just, just kidding. I like Nick very much. Uh, but since Nick's not here, not here, Cynthia. To lead. Right. Okay. Um, what about if I give you BC? Okay. <clears throat> you can you can practice with BC in your Elmo voice. BC or now? I'm sorry, that's a very, <laughs> very <laughs> Elmo voice. <laughs> <laughs> Say what? Uh, yeah, you have to practice your own voice. Um, yeah, you know, I need to practice. A to be sent. Okay. And then my favorite, to be sent. <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, Rosa. I sent. I sent, correct. Okay. Um, would be the, the best meaning for it. Now, this is the general idea. I'm going to flip to the dark side, uh, I mean the back side, where you have the third I.O. conjugation verbs. And what if um, here we drew from, oh, oh why not? Um, yeah, let's, let's go with Ubiturus. No, actually, let's not go with that. Let's go with Bacchus. Um, does it mean I made? We made. Does it mean 
Oops. Made angry by Charles. <laughs> My brain isn't working as efficiently as I'd like it to be. Uh, I'm in. So you guys would all choose the meaning simply, Shadia? Made. Made, right. Because the P cubed, Foctos, the perfect passive participle, could be either translated as made or having been made. What you're going to see is not a chart like this, but you're going to see a long column of Latin principal parts, only the principal parts of the verbs, not different forms of it. And I'm going to ask you to match that with the correct meaning in a long column of possible English meanings. It's like that quiz you took on second conjugation verbs several lessons ago. Yes, Jake? Um, I was going to ask if you Well, that's, that's what you need to recognize. You, you actually kind of do need to recognize that it is the, you know, say the fourth principal part. Um, let me give you a, a quick one more example on this side. Um, well, I don't know. There's scriptus. The uh, question is what the heck it means. I know the basic meaning is right. W-R-I-T-E. What I want to know is whether you can come up with an appropriate meaning slash translation if it's used in context. Uh, Ms. Devon, the way over there. Um, having been written. Having been written is a great meaning that you can match it up with. The other one you could use is just plain old written. Okay. So as if I were to say, um, the book written by Julius Caesar later became famous. Okay. All right, questions? Yes? What book did Julius Caesar write? Um, he wrote numerous ones. De Bello Gallico, De Bello Kiwili, okay. De Bello Alexandrino. J. Bello. <laughs> no, no, Dave Bello, JV. Okay. All right. So Caesar's Caesar's preserved writings are what are called. Uh, I shouldn't get off topic. They're called commentarii, which means notebooks, um, kind of like journals to remind him of what he did. But they're commentarii de Bello blank, which means commentaries or notebooks about a specific war. And the Bello Gallico is the war in Gaul. Gaul. De Bello Alexandrino is his war in Alexandrino. Alexandria, Egypt. Okay. When he added Egypt, sort of added Egypt to the Roman Empire or added Cleopatra to his um, <clears throat> pool of available women. Oh. Charles, do you know anything about that? <laughs> don't answer. It's safer if you don't. Okay. All right. So that's the format of tomorrow's quiz. Questions? No need. All right. So if there aren't questions, I'm going to bring back up the record feature. Here's my little tab. Okay, guys. We're we're diving back into the culture unit. We don't have. We don't have the leisure of just doing the culture unit until it's done. We're going to have to intertwine it with um, the grammar in Lesson 39 and the translation of Lesson 39 tomorrow. But um, I do want to push ahead with this because um, in some ways maybe a little bit each day is going to make it not seem overwhelming. Um, I will tell you there is a substantial test at the end of this culture unit. All right, we talked previously about the Senate and social classes and some other distinctive features, or not, not distinctive, but other broad features of the Roman Republic. The next thing to talk about is 
um, group of topics to talk about are the three assemblies the Roman ha Romans had. Citizens of the Roman Empire, or the city of Rome before it became an empire, um, had the opportunity to get together as a full group of citizens or as a limited group of citizens to discuss, actually not so much to discuss, but to vote on matters of importance in Rome's government. The Romans were, I don't want to say it, fans of, as we talked about yesterday with social classes, dividing people into groups. There's the JB group. JB, can I help you with something? Oh, I was just asking how much room I should leave for the notes that I missed yesterday. Probably about 20 pages. Just kidding, you don't need 20 pages. <laughs> no, <laughs> half a page, I guess. But the Romans were in, um, big on dividing people into groups on the basis of social class, and that operated in the assemblies of Rome, too. The Romans had three assemblies. The, the Roman word for assembly is comitia. Okay. Comitia, and this might bug you, and though you don't need to remember this particular detail, is a neuter plural noun. And um, it means an assembly, but it can also mean multiple assemblies. So the Romans have a total of three, and people were assigned to the social classes based upon I'm sorry, to the assemblies based upon their social class. Yes? Is committee where we get the word committees? It isn't. That, the word committee actually comes from com mito, to send people together. Okay. Committee, uh, this noun means it's from a slightly different verb root, the verb eo ira, which means go. Okay. So these are people who go together, separate from the whole group, and they meet and discuss things. All right, broad general statement about the three comitia. Can I now move on? Say yes or no. No. One second. Okay. We're going to get into detailed discussion of each of the three, but the big picture, to repeat, is that people were assigned to a particular assembly based on social class, and that particular, a particular assembly had a limited scope of whom they elected and what they could discuss in terms of the parts of Rome's government. I'm going to go forward if I can. Okay. We're going to start with the smallest of the assemblies, which was called the Comitia Curiata. Stick with me for just a moment. Okay, before you dive into writing, do you see a word in the phrase or title Coriata? Say, yes, yes, I do. Why? What is the Curia? Care. No. Ooh. If you weren't in my Latin 1 class that last year, you're at a slight disadvantage. Okay. Slight. Okay. No, I'm, I'm. Oh my goodness! Just in terms of this particular content area or topic, not content area. Yeah, this piece of trivial information that isn't so trivial after all. Isn't it like a senate house? Exactly. The curia was Rome was Rome's senate house, and I talked about this at a couple different points in Latin one in my classroom, and and it's all good. Okay. So the Curia was the Senate House, which is a valuable way of remembering what this assembly was limited to. It was limited to members, uh, current members of the Senate, and also to all adult male citizens who were, whether they were in the Senate currently or not, who were patricians. Those people who were descendants of the original senators. These Roman citizens of high social status had their own special assembly, which focused primarily on matters having to do with Romans, the Roman state religion, the religious beliefs and practices and priesthoods that were integrated into Rome's government. 
in the United States, broadly speaking, our presidents do not take any orders or direction or consult with religious authorities on matters of public policy. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, you can decide. But generally speaking, you know, President Bush did not necessarily consult with a group of church leaders to see if um, we should go to war in Iraq or Afghanistan. And that was a politi purely political decision. In Rome, there was a much closer intermingling of religion and government. One of the things that um, the Committee of Pariata did was elect priests, men to fill the role, men to fill the role of certain priesthoods. And we have not done a thorough job of talking about Roman religion. We don't really do so until Latin IV, and then only if there's time. They would also vote on questions of allowing new gods to come into the Rome, the, the city of Rome, to be worshipped in the city of Rome. And I, please remind me, did we have any discussions about Rome, the Romans ever admitting the worship of a new god or not admitting the worship of a new god? Okay. We have talked a little bit obliquely or indirectly about the Romans not welcoming Christianity, but that's fairly late. Okay. Um, we probably at some point should talk about the Romans admitting or allowing the worship of Eastern god as gods or goddesses like Isis or Serapis from Egypt, or the god Aesculapius from Greece. The Romans had no god. Uh, well, what was Aesculapius the god of? Oh my gosh. I tell you what. If I can pull up a pen quickly here, I'll show you his symbol. It is a staff entwined by snake. snakes. One snake. Help. Medicine. Asclepius was a god of healing and medicine imported from the Greek world because the Romans had no god of health or healing or medicine. But Asclepius, a Greek god, the, the worship of Asclepius was admitted by the Romans at a time when Rome was having a terrible plague, and the Romans couldn't cure it through their traditional religion, um, and so they allowed for the worship of Asclepius on Tiber Island, uh, actually not within the, the walled city of Rome, but on the island in the middle of the Tiber River. I want to tell you super quickly before the bell rings and we run out of time. This assembly had only very small political influence, very small direct role in Rome's government. And truly, truly, it wasn't a direct role, it was indirect. If you don't pack up, if you are a member of the Comitia Curiata and you're planning on running for election to high office next year, you might want to have a certain person fill the role of augur. The word augur, A-U-G-U-R, is a priest who interprets oracles, oracles or more particularly the flight of birds. birds. Okay? The, the, the flight of birds, kind of like the sacred chickens, or events in the sky. Now hold on just a second. Why would you want to have that person in the role of augur? Exactly. They can affect the timing of elections. They can say, ooh, I see a bird flying in the wrong direction. It is a bad omen for Rome. We cannot hold elections today. And if elections are delayed long enough, sometimes people can't stay around to vote. One of the things that's hugely important to know is that to vote in ancient Rome, guess where you had to be? In the city of Rome. And if your house was 100 miles from Rome and you were a Roman citizen, to be there on election day, you had to plan and travel that 100 miles and you had to have a place to stay in Rome in order to vote on the day of the election. So there were ways in which politics and government was affected indirectly by this assembly. Okay? We'll get to the really media assemblies tomorrow. I'm going to go ahead and stop now. Oh, this is going to stay.